Tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai haramai and welcome to tonight's live stream kōrero, Arts and Climate Action. Ko Delina wihi peihana tōku ingoa, he uri aho ngō Ngāti Raukawa me Ngāti Tūkorehi. Thank you for joining us this evening to this event brought to you by PANS and Track Zero in partnership with Auckland Live. Our topic for discussion tonight is what have we learned from COVID-19? I'll begin tonight's session with a karakia, me karakia tato. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro. Tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, kau mie huie, tāhie. I'm very pleased to introduce my co-chair for tonight's session, Sarah Meads from Track Zero. Kia ora, Sarah. Kia ora. And a big welcome to those of you watching live on Facebook and YouTube, and thank you for those who may watch it later. We hope you're all keeping well in Level 2 across New Zealand. Arts and Climate Innovation is a series of non-partisan live stream kōrero bringing together speakers from the sciences, arts and creative and cultural communities to hear their perspectives on the powerful role arts can play in shaping a fair carbon neutral future. This is our fifth episode in a series of six kōrero every Wednesday at seven o'clock, exploring a range of themes. On tonight's panel, we'll discuss how artists and scientists continue to play a vital role in supporting our well-being and explore what we've learned from our COVID-19 response and what this means and how we tackle the climate crisis. Sharing their thoughts and insights with us this evening, our scientist, author, director of Te Pūnaha Matatini National Research Centre, Professor Sean Hendy, Faumu Matthew Salapu, aka Anonymous, and Norma Seal Faumu from 37 Hertz, who are both work in music composition, media and community arts advocacy, writer and theatre maker Joe Randerson from Barbarian Productions, and acclaimed visual and performance artist Lisa Rehana. We'd love to hear from you during the panel. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop them in the comments section. And we have a team behind the scenes who will feed those questions through to us and we'll ask our panelists. Our first panelist is Lisa Rehana. And Lisa is known for a practice that interrogates gender, power and representation. She works with video, photography, installation, performance, design, costume and sculptural forms to challenge fiction and assume truths. She draws from mythological realms, historical evidence and imagined narratives to do this. Lisa's working commissions are held in prestigious private and public collections around New Zealand and offshore. And her international work Lou uh, Te Hapu, um, ko Lisa Rehana Takunga. Um, lovely to be here in this Māori Language Week, um, thinking about these issues of um, sustainability, certainly um, bringing focus to um, to the Māori Week this week in Aotearoa, New Zealand is wonderful. Um, growing up um, in the 1970s, when I was really hoping to have access to te reo Māori and it was very absent from education, any education system at, at that time, it's really amazing to see um, what's happening um, within Aotearoa New Zealand now. So bringing focus uh, to any issue and just sharing it out into the world and um, creating an energy around it is really important. So these conversations and these opportunities um, are very important. So I just wanted to thank uh, the organisers once again for um, allowing me to be part of this. And also to the other speakers, it's awesome. You look like little postage stamps, but I know you've got so many awesome things to share together. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And um, what, I, what I thought I'd do is just talk um, very briefly about a a work I made a long time ago and then um, another work that I've made more recently um, and just to really think just to share some of the ideas and reasons why I made them and um, hopefully that can kick off and become a point you know there should be some other intersections that happen with other people's work too so um, just to start the process I'll find a little internet 
clicker. Oh, so first image up. I wanted to talk about um, a project I made. Um, I began in 2001. Um, it was titled Digital Marae. And for me, um, this work gave me an opportunity to really investigate um, cultural practice, um, Maori cultural practice, and the marae that um, I come from up north, uh, Pukirata, um, has no carving, but it does have weaving. And we have a uh, whaditaonga, where we have a waka installed. Um, so when I was dreaming about um, what would line the uh, whare nui if it had had carvings in there, who might I want to see, and what might I want to know from that, I began um, looking at stories, um, mythologies, but I really dislike that term mythologies because I think it makes it seem like it's a fantasy, whereas um, for us, it's our whakapapa, it's, it's, it's what kind of um, grows us. And um, so one of the images that I um, was looking at uh, was Hini Pukohurai, and you can see her on the right hand side of the screen. Um, I, be I began making digital marae to think about lining the interior of the walls, but also as a type of transgression, really pushing against that idea of um, that only Maori men carved. Certainly in the far north, um, Jane Torpia um, uh, carved her own marae, and I visited that space. Um, but also to think about how do you encourage and entice youth into, um, you know, making it, uh, it for, it's a terrible terminology, but to make something sexy, what is it that you do? So um, my work with different filmmakers and broadcasting organizations, um, the push to uh, disseminate new imagery of ourselves to entice people to look at our own histories. This is where Digital Marae falls. This particular work is about, as a tuhoi story. So Hini Pokohurangi is um, a tuhoi, um, the Miss Maiden is her um, English title. Um, and she's an amazing figure. Um, I actually went and did some um, trekking through Tuhoi, and as a, um, it's a phenomenon that you have in the bush, deep in the bush, in the morning, overnight, the mists settle on the land. And um, as the sun rises, it burns away the mist and, and so to reveal the bush underneath. So I was thinking about this idea of what, what, what might she look like if she was a, a female entity. And I have this kind of image of her as a cloud picking up her skirts and leaving the land each day. Um, it's a beautiful story and it has another aspect to it, talking about um, a human seeing Hini Pukohurangi, falling in love with her, enticing her to be his mistress and eventually his wife. And he, many of his friends keep saying, you keep telling us you have a wife, you keep telling us you're married, but we've never seen her. So one night um, he blocks up the, the doorway and the window in the whare nui so that she doesn't realize it's her time to leave and she gets stuck so she stays too late um, on earth. So the further aspect of the story that I found out through um, uh, a friend of mine who's, who's from Tuhoi is that her younger sister calls out to her and says, Hane you, you're, you've stayed too long on earth and she calls her forward as she realizes that her husband's played a trick on her, she said, "You're never gonna, you're never gonna find me again. This is this is not the right thing." And so, yes. the story um, has some wonderful aspects to it. It's about um, nature and it being things happening in the right order, leaving Earth at the right time. It's about whakapapa, it's about the care between um, two sisters and then looking out for each other. The further story is um, Hini Pukohurangi's husband is so distraught when she leaves, he becomes um, a rainbow. So it's about these kind of elemental things that happen on earth. 
um, and also the tears uh, through love um, falling back down to the earth and that those tears um, feeding the ground with not just love um, but with the, with the materials, the, the, the matter that's required to, to um, feed the earth. So I wanted to talk about Hiniao and Hini Pukohurangi because although these things have lovely mythological stories, they have real, um, they're talking about real things, things happening in the correct order. Um, more recently, I was involved with um, designing a new road, a new public space in Auckland Central. And this was a wonderful project. And I did want to talk about this tonight because I got to work with a, an incredible um, landscape architect called Megan Range, who just passed away um, in the last month. So it's an opportunity for me um, to share the love. Um, it was a great joy to work with her. And she's a great conservationist. One of the things, uh, she's done a lot of projects around New Zealand. But she rang me out and said, I really want to work with um, and need to work with a, um, somebody in Māori on the team and wondered if you'd like to work on this project. And I came on board and it was an incredible thing to do. Um, it's kind of like a love letter to Auckland for me to create a space within Auckland and to really think about what is it that I would want to have in these public spaces for other communities. And um, so it's a development that's happening down the bottom of um, Auckland, downtown. And there's a number of new buildings, not cheap buildings, but there are more people moving into the city. And um, what I felt was, it's always been the sort of CBD and I really thought about um, children and the idea of play. So I wanted to put that at the center of this project. Um, originally, the space was called East West Street. And I said, well, that's really um, very uninteresting. It's a bit like North Island and South Island, who came up with such wonderful names for the glorious country that we live in. So the first thing that I really wanted to do was like, talk to the mana whenua around Tamaki Makoto and ask for feedback for a new name for the space. So if you, if you talk about something and just give it a nickname, you'll never get to the point where you really give it a Maori name or you really want to reinstate this idea of this area of downtown Auckland. The space itself is um, a piece of reclaimed land. Um, previously, uh, it's a very long street. Um, it straddles quite a number of blocks. Um, and I wanted to think of it about it almost like a walker, um, a space that holds a community that people are rowing together, particularly this idea of east and west and um, looking east as the sun rises is really important within Maoridom, welcoming in the new day. Um, and really thinking about, okay, if we create a space and there's lots of concrete, I mean, it's just the um, urban built environment is very much full of uh, concrete. So um, when we looked at a map of Auckland at either end of the street, we, we felt that, that was, they were the launching pads. That was actually where um, there was land um, 150 years ago before it was reclaimed. So it sort of started to think about how can we create a street that looks to its histories. Um, this image here gives you a sense of looking down the street. Um, at either end of each street, um, there's a Nikau playground at one end and there's a Kofi playground at the other. Um, this Po figure that you see, um, the idea is kind of um, putting um, a stake in the ground, um, a place where you would haul up a walker and tie it to. And this is actually, um, inside this, there's a, a, a sound sculpture and I worked with um, uh, Ricky Bennett, who's a Tonga Pūrō um, musician. And I also recorded some sounds of a dawn chorus. So at 6am every morning, the sound of a dawn chorus plays from this poem. 
And um, as soon as it started playing, it was really wonderful. Um, the birds started to sing. So it was kind of attracting, attracting them more of a, the natural world. Um, and I wanted to think about the dawn chorus as a blessing of the street every morning. So there's something that welcomes people, that makes it um, safe as they're transiting across the street. Within the street, we call these things purposeful puddles. So I went around local area and I photographed um, the original shoreline and what it kind of looked like. Um, it's quite tidal. It's a mahinga kai. It's a place where food was gathered. Um, but I, I, I love it as kids always jump in puddles and make people wet. And so I really wanted to create a, a road where kids can have lots of fun and play in it. So these purposeful puddles, they fill and um, fill with water twice a day. So they're pegged to the tides. So if, if you would, if this concrete wasn't sitting on the top of the road, you would be um, within that kind of tidal zone. So it's really to, um, as a way of reminding people of these original lines, these original spaces. Um, working with Megan Wright was wonderful. She's done a lot of this kind of work. The types of plantings that we were using is a really light touch on the ground, but it's also um, cleaning the water, making sure the water would be cleaned as it goes back into the harbour and as you can see and the water I, I had no idea but all the dogs come in there and drink and you know kids play in it and you know we needed to know that 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 sustain and um not going to create any more issues this particular area um was very dirty needed to be cleaned up um, and stabilized. So we really wanted to look at like the service, this idea of attending and being at um, a beach. The other things I wanted to do is when you think about creating public spaces um, is having something that's from dawn till dusk that people are gonna transit across the space and encounter it in different times of the day. So as a street, we needed to provide lighting. And so I was really thinking about um, string games so these lights kind of zigzag across um, in the center of the space. There's a reference to um, um, Puanga uh, or the Southern Cross. Um, the space, because it's surrounded by a lot of uh, concrete, I said, if we use these um, puddles, they reflect the stars above. Um, or during the day, even when it's wintry, there's sort of a more uh, light kind of bounces around the street. And I uh, wanted to sort of feel like these little um, seats that people sit on, it's almost like they're sitting within a walker. Um, what else do we have? And so that's kind of, it's one of my favorite aspects of the road is, is this lighting. Um, or as sun rises and the sun sets, you kind of really become, um, you look up and there's the center, sense of the stars above. So trying to look at the urban environment and remind people of the beauty of Aotearoa, um, the stories that surround us and kind of softening as much as we possibly can um, these spaces that we um, inhabit. So that's my final little blah blah for now. And I think I've just, um, leave it for the next um the next artist to speak and just thank you for letting me um share those few ideas with you good Lisa. thank you so much for sharing those ideas i really love the way that in your work you're bringing whakapapa our atua our stories and our customary ways of being into the modern world and particularly in that those public spaces it's really exciting so that we know people will see be able to see and feel our stories even if it's by osmosis to kind of help inform our way of being in the world. So thank you very much, Lisa. Sure and it's my pleasure to introduce our next panellist this evening, Dr. Sean Hendy. Sean is the Director of Te Pūnaha Matatini, New Zealand Centre of Research Excellence, which is a national research network, network that uses methods from complex systems to solve problems for business and to develop better economic and environmental policies. 
Sean teaches in both the Department of Physics and the Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Auckland. In 2012, Sean was awarded the Callaghan Medal by the Royal Society of New Zealand and the Prime Minister's Science Media Communication Prize for his work as a science communicator. In 2013, he co-authored Get Off the Grass with the late Sir Paul Callaghan. This was followed by Silencing Silence in May 2016 and his new book, Hashtag No Fly, Walking the Talk on Climate Change in 2019, that described his year of no flying to reduce his carbon footprint. Welcome, Sean. Uh, kia ora, Diana. Um, yeah, uh, ko Sutton Bank, te maunga. Uh, ko Liverai te awa, ko Yorkshire te iwi, uh, no manawa tua hou, uh, ko Sean Hindi a hou. And I'd just I'd like to say kia ora to Lisa for creating such a wonderful public space um, that's that I, I didn't know about the 6 a.m. dawn chorus. I'm going to have to get up very early on Saturday and head down there on my bike. That would be a fantastic thing to, to do and see. So thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, look, I, I want to um, talk a little bit about um, some of the work I, I do as, as well as how I interact a little bit with, um, with, the, with the arts community. And, and hopefully you can all... Um, see the, the slide that I've I included um, uh, tonight. So this is actually, um, it's, a, it's, it's a number of images from a, a collaboration I had with artist Gabby O'Connor um, back in, in uh, 2012, 2013. Um, it, it's called Order Structure Pattern. Um, and it, it um, was a, my first uh, genuine collaboration with an artist. And it was really um, the interaction between Gabby and I it was really, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, I, I work on, on something called complex systems, which, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but, you know, everything interesting in the world in some sense is a complex system, right? It, you know, the simple things in life are often not that interesting. They may be pleasurable, um, but um, it's the complex things that we're drawn to um, and that often also create problems for us. And this is, this is the sort of space that I work in. And, and I was really interested, you know, I have a, a very personal perspective um, on, on a complex system. You know, I'm a, I'm a physicist. I have a very particular approach to, to complex systems. I often use mathematics um, to try and understand complex systems. And I really wanted to see and understand how other people might view my work. You know, how is it when, when I describe my work to people, how do, what do they see in return? And so over, over about six months, and it was actually during the writing of, of Get Off the Grass, um, I was sharing some of the work behind that with Gabby. And Gabby was interpreting that. She was reading my chapters. Um, she was in a garage experimenting with different ways. You know, after, after reading a chapter from the book, um, she'd, she'd try and create a piece of work that kind of reflected what she'd learned and what she'd seen in the work um, that I was doing. And in the end, she came up... Um, with what I would call a network. Um, it's actually, um, it was fabricated from electrical cable and it, it's, it's a woven network of electrical cables of different colors. Um, and, and a lot of what I, what I do is study networks. I study interactions between things, between people, um, uh, between objects. Uh, and, and those connections can be represented in a network form, which we can describe mathematically. And, and Gabby built this, this wonderful, what I would call space-filling network, right? It took up physical space. It was in the National Library. I could go and stand in the middle of, of a network, you know, it, which, is, which is so different from um, when you're a scientist. And, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But as a scientist, we're, we're trained to take ourselves out of the problem, right? The last thing we want is to have ourselves in there, right? You know, we just clutter things up, human beings. So we try and take ourselves out of the world um, and, and describe the world's world without us in it. And, and Gabby put me back um, in the world with, with, that, with that piece of art. And so, so yeah, so, so complex systems, um, uh, you know, really describe much of the world um, around us. And indeed, you know, of course, one of the things that's brought us together um, uh, tonight is, is, is climate change. You know, that's one of the missions of, of Track Zero. And it's one of the things that I'm um, very interested in. Um, but of course, we're, we're online tonight because of COVID. Um, uh, you know, we're not, we're not face to face. We're not in an auditorium. We're not filling space. 
in the way we would if we were um, in, the, in the National Library. Um, and, and we're getting to a point in the world, um, you know, where our, our, our relationship with the world is becoming very complex and it's, it's having an, an effect back on us. I think in particular, um, these problems are becoming very urgent. Right? Our, our, you know, for, for a long time, we've tried to solve problems with very simple solutions. Um, and of course, there's still a very, a very strong tendency to do that today. And as we get closer to the election over the next few weeks, the solutions will, that we're presented with will become simpler and simpler and simpler. Um, and, and really, these are, these are not solutions. Um, these, are, these are, at best, they, um, they delay the inevitable. And that's really what, you know, what we face with climate change. Um, you know, climate change that is something that's, that's very slowly creeping up on us. Um, I've been aware, aware of climate change since I was 12 years old. Um, you know, I'm now, I'm now almost 50. Um, it's very, very slowly crept up on me. I've only, I mean, I, I've understood the science uh, for quite a long period of time, uh, but it's only become personal to me in the last few years. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, to deal with it, it's got to have to become personal to everyone. Um, and, and if we leave it too late, it will become personal to everyone. And that's, that's what we're facing at the, at the moment. I think particularly this year, um, you know, where we're looking at, at what's happening and happened in Australia over the summer, what's happening in California right now. Um, you know, we, we can't, you know, we, we really do have to act um, before those kind of events, you know, strike us, you know, take us, take things over globally. I think that's, that's the big challenge um, that, that, that we face. And, and there's a, you know, there's a real problem, right? It, it, it's not, it, the sim solutions aren't simple, as I say. Individual action, right, actually has no impact. This is one of the things I, I, I grapple with as a scientist. I can change my lifestyle. Um, we can all individually make changes in our lifestyle. That's not sufficient um, to deal with climate change. Yet, you know, normally we would look to government to solve these problems, yet government is, is, is unable to move. Um, and so we're really we're, we're stuck in this in a situation where it's very very difficult to um, to generate collective action to make movements that are meaningful. We can make individual actions, but we've got to somehow tra translate that into into more than just ourselves. Um, and so this is this is for me, I think where where communication becomes so important, and and all forms of communication. I mean, I'm I'm typically involved in. Um, uh, in talking to the media, I write books, and that reaches a certain audience um, with certain types of information. But we actually have to, you know, we have to um, uh, communicate the challenges much more widely um, and, and much more comprehensively to people uh, to, 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 to take those individual actions and to turn them into collective actions. And so for me, in a way, that's about putting myself back into my science. And, and that was my no-fly year. Um, so... So Delina mentioned the, the, my most recent book, which is hashtag no fly. Um, and that was really about me confronting my own personal responsibilities uh, for, for um, climate change, putting myself back into my science and really looking at myself in the mirror um, in the way that perhaps Gabby first did for me with her art. And I think in some ways that's, that's, the, that's the power of art, right? It puts us into the problem. Um, and, and really, it can also communicate the complexity of what we face. Um, I, many, many forms of communication that we use have to be simplified. You know, when I talk to a journalist, when I'm on TV, I'm constantly having to simplify the messages that I give. And, and I don't think art faces that compromise. I think art can be used to put people in complex situations and to, to, to confront them with complexity. And so for me, that's the, that's the value of conversations like these, conversations between sciences and the arts, is, is normally to communicate science, we have to simplify. Whereas when, we, when we're dealing with art, when we're talking to artists, actually that, we, you know, that complexity can come across very, very strongly um, in the way that we talk to people. Um, and so that's why you know, I very much uh, enjoy these, these types of conversations. I enjoy working with artists because it is one situation where, where, where simplification is not, is not the way. Um, you know, we can bring complexity to these conversations. 
and look, you know, we all do face a very big challenge. Um, uh, uh, Sarah asked me to emphasize this, <laughs> um, just to, um, you know, it's, it's very, it's very tempting to, um, to, and to focus on the short term issues. And of course, this is what our government will be focusing on for the next, next couple of years as we deal with the COVID crisis and, and who can blame them? You know, that's, it, it's, uh, it is an unprecedented crisis. It's affecting all of us, some of us greatly. Um, and it, it is going to um, uh, deliver some big challenges for us uh, um, over the next few years. But we've somehow got to emerge from this with solutions ready made to deal with the climate. Because climate change is not getting any easier. When we emerge from the, from the COVID crisis, climate change is waiting for us and it's only getting worse. And you just have to look to California to see how these things um, become coupled. I mean, one of the one of the, the strange things, you know, California has typically used its prison workforce to fight fires. Now you can argue about the ethics and morals of that, but that's been their firefighting force. This this year, their prisons are empty because of COVID. Um, they've had to empty out their their correction system. Their firefighters are, are, are no longer um, available, and you know, and they're fight, facing an incredible crisis. And we don't want to leave ourselves in that position. We want to emerge from this crisis ready to take on uh, on climate. So yeah, I'll just leave it leave it there. And I just I should finish by just apologising. My hotel Wi-Fi was not up to this. Um, so I'm, so I'm in a bar, and I'm happy to take questions about the quality of the craft beer or, or critique of the bar music um, at the end. So th thank you, and I'll hand back to Delina. Thank you, Sean. Um, Look, what you've been talking about, the power of art putting us into the problem um, and helping to communicate complexity, which is the area that you're involved with, but that comment that in science you're, you're really led or taught to take yourself out of and observe um, objectively. It's a really interesting um, way of framing um, this discussion and the fact that we've got complexity and yet um, we oversimplify some of our um, responses. Uh, and and that, that sort of nexus is what we need to tackle and the way arts can actually be a platform to enable us into you know, exploring that more. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, it, it leaves me next to welcome our next two panelists. They are what I call a powerhouse couple Noma Sio Faumu and Faumu Matthew Salapu. Noma is a managing director and producer of 37 Hertz, community arts advocate and a cultural and protocols advisor. Her career in the music and arts industry, she puts down to her introduction at Otara Music Arts Centre when she was really little. She's a recipient of the 2019 and all girl Community Star Awards Foundation North and of the 2016 Special Recognition Award Creative New Zealand Pacifica Arts Awards. Noma is on the board of Sounds Centre for New Zealand Music and also the advocacy and business development support for Te Akai Collective, a new formed collective for Pacifica performance. Introducing Matthew, aka Anonymous, is a sound music and video producer and director of 37 Hertz. His work spans traditional music composition and production through to experiment, avant-garde, sound art and powerful accompanying video. He has received many awards and the latest being a finalist for Best Producer, Pacific Music Awards 2018 and Emerging Artist Creative New Zealand Pacific Arts Awards 2016 and many others. He has produced the organisations like the Auckland Museum, Auckland Philharmonic Orchestra, Auckland Library and others, and for many music artists, including his production of the track Master in the rock soundtrack for Dwayne Johnson's Hollywood blockbuster, Hobbs and Shaw. So welcome Norma and Matthew. Um, awesome. Um, salute to everybody up in here. Um, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Matt. I am, I deal in, in this back cave here with frequencies. In a way, I, I view myself as a bit of a combination 
of Lisa's work as, as well as Sean. Um, there's obviously the artistic side to my role in terms of music production. Um, but in that, there's so much analysis of, of data and frequencies and hertz and how they're shaped and, and reshaped and so forth. So um, it's, it's a real honor to be amongst um, the panel here. Uh, my name is Norma Seal Salapu Bayumu. Um, I'm really grateful to be here with Alina Pans and uh, with Sarah from Track Zero. Um, it's an honor to be hearing some of the kōrero from Sean and also Lisa and look forward to kind of just contributing towards the kōrero. So, yeah, I guess um, of all the different things we could have um, talked about today, I think the most appropriate one, given what, what's already been mentioned in terms of um, these crazy times to, that we're in with COVID, um, we were approached um, by the government um, second week into the lockdown um, to create some content for their uh, Pacific media channels that would go on all the mainstream Pacific media, as well as the nine recognised Pacific languages here in Aotearoa. Um, in all their community stations as well as mainstream stations and radio stations and TV so it would just blanket the Pacific community so obviously with COVID um, you know having its impact on big production crews TV crews going out um, we were hit up um, by Bright Sunday and the New Zealand government to um, basically take a lot of the messaging that was slipping under the radar for a lot of our Pacific communities as we know they're quite at risk because of the makeup of our families um, and our communities in terms of, um, you know, the large population base that are in enclosed spaces and so forth. And it reminded me of when we first moved into this facility and we hosted my parents here for the first time. Um, and they were talking about when they first moved over from the islands um, and they had no resources and, and no, um, no language. They couldn't speak the language. They had no money. They didn't know anybody and they're in a foreign country, but, you know, it was an exciting time for them. And then it dawned on me how horrifying it would be for a lot of our Pacific communities here in Aotearoa who don't have any of that. And plus, for the first time in, their, in our lives, a pandemic hits and they don't understand any of the official communications that are coming out on radio, TV, online and so forth. And so it was a really exciting opportunity to basically analyse the data that the government were giving us in the translations and figure out reverse engineer a production pipeline of creating a really small run and gun team. So instead of having nine big teams that would traditionally go out into people's homes um, to um, you know, create a lot of the content for our communities, um, we basically just created a two man team and, and created a really efficient pipeline to um, bring the messaging to our people. Yeah, we had about three or four days to kind of put infrastructure in place uh, for the processing of that. At that time, COVID was really, was new. Uh, and the, and we didn't have a lot of information about how we could move um, safely in our community. So we had three, four days. You know, I suppose for a lot of our Pacific and Māori communities, um, we're very resourceful about how we use our resources. So, so we reached out to our networks, and the first thing we did was really engage with um, one of our Pacifica nurses, Josie, who helped us with the whole protocol around um, how we go into people's homes and not just from a health and safety point of view, but also from a, a, a whaaluaalo, a respectful view of how we enter into people's homes during this time when there's so much challenge and uncertainty about um, COVID. So uh, we worked, walked through a lot of all of that stuff and we had to do it very quickly. So we kind of had three, four days to engage nine families who spoke the nine different main Pacific languages um, who had a range of elder children, parents in those homes. And then we had that, you know, really short, quick time frame to kind of turn that around. And uh, we're really grateful for the support in the background also from, from people like Stella from Bright Sunday um, and also the Ministry of Pacific People back in the background, just trying to clear all the protocols and whatnot before we could start the whole filming process. Yeah, it was a really fascinating position to be in, um... Because in a sense, while the rest of the country is being told to close off your bubbles, um, what we're essentially asking was nine Pacific families to open up their bubbles and let us come in um, in a very safe, optimised way and document 
what they were going through on a regular basis because you know everybody's isolated in the bubbles and as pacific people we are so used to engaging with each other in our churches and in our schools and, and all this sort of thing so this wasn't going to be a talking heads interview in some studio space we had to go to the fort you know to the to the front line of, of, of our communities and document how they were getting through. And, and, and in our sense, that was a real privilege for us because we were able to see up close and personal how nine different cultures coped with this unprecedented situation, how they were allocating their time, how they were allocating their resources. Um, and so, you know, it's essentially, like, for myself, I, I grew up... Um, you know, making making hip hop beats in the bedroom, swapping cassette tapes on tape decks, and and making beats out of that, and always repurposing samples. Like you find a sample, and how many beats can you make out of the sample? And over time, I guess philosophically, I realized, hey, that's pretty much what our you know ancestors used to always do with synth. You know, you've got a natural resource, and you were able to take this one natural resource, and how many ways could you flip synth? How, how many? industries could you supply and um you know synod supply the textiles um clothing industry the boat building binding joining joining uh, industry um architecture and all these types of things and for myself as a digital artist that works primarily in the in the sh in the capture and the shaping of sound frequencies and videos you know this was an opportunity to get all this data from the living rooms and the garages of our of our families get get all these recordings and then come back edit them in a really fast way create a, you know, how many ways can we flip the sound um, and, and the storytelling so that we can get these into 90 minute, 90 second blocks that are as efficient as possible across all the distribution channels so that those people that are from our communities that are isolated out there during this crazy time and they don't understand the mainstream messaging coming out, but they, they pr prefer to hear it in their mother tongue. What is the production pipeline? to get it across in the most informative as well as entertaining way. So a lot of the content um, got really great engagement over, over millions of views um, with numerous um, videos and so forth. And it was a really rewarding time for myself um, in terms of the artistic challenges, but more so just the fact that, you know, these, these humble families, and I'd like to acknowledge the Tuitupo family, the Tongan family, um, who, and she, she was one of the main stars of the series and um, she has since passed away. Um, but it was a real privilege during this time to kind of be up and close and personal with our communities and see how they were um, coping with everything that's happening. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, over six weeks of filming, we got to know each of the families really quite well. And I suppose one thing for me that really stuck out was um, just how much art mattered to our Pacific communities. Uh, traditionally for us as Pacific people, we don't, we haven't necessarily written our history or you know, it's all passed down orally through, it's inked on us, it's in our songs and our dance, and that's kind of how we've part of that and part of those, um, our history on. And one of the, you know, prevalent things that came forward, especially with our elders and the, those families, was um, the, how they, re, re, the, how they um, used art to keep, to get them through the whole isolation process. We had, you know, people, the some other families weaving, dancing, singing. It was just such a close time for them to be sharing something so natural to them to keep keep them going through that whole process of co the unknown. Yeah, so, um, yeah, once again, it was, uh, you know, a really amazing time for us, um, as well as a scary time. Um, you know, like we didn't want to be the, the, the source of an outbreak <laughs> going into... Um, a lot of these families. So there was a lot of apprehension, but, you know, it was all about putting into practice, you know, best practice, um, you know, what is the best way to engage? What is the best way to transfer a lapel microphone with these wipes and all these types of things? Like, I felt sorry for a lot of the guests because we look like alien scientists with all this gear on. PPE gear for <laughs> And, you know, the cameras and, um, you know, and here we are trying to get them to kind of open up themselves. So, you know, we were only messengers, we were only playing our role in getting it out there, but the true heroes and the true stars were the communities because by them opening up and showing themselves carving and weaving and singing and cooking donuts and weaving um, lays, you know, every other family out there that identifies it with that in their own bubble were able to feel like, oh, hey, we're doing that too. There's a sense of normalcy and um, 
you know, relaxation about that to minimize the stress that even though there was isolation in a way that um, we were all in this together. So it was a real privilege um, to, to serve on this project. Sweet, peace. Kia ora kōrua. thank you so much for sharing your experiences and thoughts. Um, beautiful Norma, how you spoke about how art can get people through a crisis. I think that's really amazing and important, but also amazing how fast you both mobilised your own artistic skills as digital artists to kind of pivot and be able to support the community by creating all those videos that you made to help spread the important messages at the time as well. So thank you both very much for your corridor this evening. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Joe Randerson, our final panelist for this evening. Joe is a writer and theatre maker and the founder and artistic director of performing arts company Barbarian Productions, who are based in Porniki. Recent theatre works of Barbarian include Sing It To My Face, Political Cuts and Grand Opening. Joe also teaches on the Masters of Fine Arts at Te Hiringa Waka Victoria University of Wellington. Jo has received the Robert Burns Fellowship. She's an Arts Foundation New Generation Award winner and also has won the award for playwriting, the Bruce Mason Award. Jo collaborates internationally with, with visual artists, theatre makers and activists. And she often collaborates with communities and lesser heard voices. She is a public speaker and a progressive thinker about the arts relevance in society and an advocate for sustainable practice in the arts. Kia ora Jo, welcome. Uh, kia ora, Delina, and tēnā koutou katoa, tolo for lava. Ka tukumihi o ki te maunga, te maunga whau. Ka tukumihi o ki te moana, te whanganui ātara. Uh, I tupuaki o i te mana whenua o Ngāti Toa, me te ati awa, no tamaki makaurau ahau, ko poniki toku kainga noho in INA. Ko Randerson, toku Fano, ko Barbarian Productions, toku Rōpū, ko Vogelmoin Bowling Club, toku Tūranga Waiwai, ko Joe toku Ingoa. Uh, nā mihi, kia koutou, it is a great pleasure for me also to be here and I feel honoured to be last to have had the privilege of hearing everyone else speak first. So thank you, uh, Lisa and Norma and Matt and Sean for what you have said already. And uh, thanks Sarah and Delina for holding us into this corridor and also everyone backstage. Thanks Edward for uh, holding our slides for us. Um, I am speaking to you from Vogelmorn, which is uh, now an, a non-suburb actually. It's not even uh, really a, considered a suburb here in Porniki, um, but we've taken over an old bowling club as a community space. And it's a very exciting place to have as a base. Um, it's a work in progress. We are all learning what it is as it develops and the arts are a really big part um, of the activity there, along with the food, along with the mushroom foraging, uh, along with the shamanic workshops, along with all the beautiful and very different things that happen in the space. At the moment, we have a, a festival called Spring Uprising, which is a festival which celebrates social change and art and how we can work together for that. Um, so I bring you greetings from, from that festival and everyone's, uh, everyone who is part of that. Uh, for me, I just wanted to honour a little bit where some of my social activism came from. I grew up in St Peter's Church here, um, which I remember as a place full of a lot of argument. Um, but good argument, healthy argument, where people were working through the nitty gritty, as you say, Sean, a, a complex system. Um, and there was a real commitment with that community of people to hear each other out and to work towards some outcome that would, that would suit everyone. Um, and I think a lot of my activism comes, comes from that place and from my parents, Jackie and Richard. Um, I also want to honour in this corridor about climate change, sort of how I got started a little bit into, into science. Um, well, actually, I, was, I loved science at school. Those were my best subjects because I didn't think arts was a career. Um, and maybe I'm still not sure if it is. Uh, but I was very lucky to be asked to be part of a project here. Um, I'm hoping that can be seen a little bit there. It was called Our Angels OK. And Sean, it was with your colleague, Paul Callahan. He and Bill Manhire put artists and scientists together to, to make projects. Um, and I'd 
I really, that's probably my big word for the day is, is collaboration and how we can work together. Um, it was really interesting in that collaboration. Um, the artists were very inspired by the scientists. Um, I'm not sure how inspired the scientists were by the artists. They were kind of bemused, but Sean, I really, I felt really grateful to hear you talk so passionately about what art can do um, and the complexity that it can, can hold. So, so thank you. Thank you for speaking to that. Um, the Royal Society work continued on and we started to focus on climate change and I started to read, you know, big books like this book, Collapse by Jared, by Jared Diamond, um, which was really depressing. Um, and I, I, had, I had a good few year period of great anxiety as I started to really wake up to what was happening in the world around us. And then I had children uh, and felt even more anxious <laughs> about how their lives would, would continue uh, in the situation uh, that we're in. And to be honest, um, the only way out of my anxiety was to, to actually contemplate that we, we, might, we might go as a species. I know that might sound a bit more, but I had to accept that, that we, it's possible that we, we make ourselves extinct. Um, and that's a sad possibility, and I don't want that possibility, but by somehow by considering that, it activated me towards fighting for what I believe in, uh, in this world. And what feels most precious to me in this world right now is our cultural practices, our, our spiritual practices, um, practices that have, that have grown over centuries from people connected to very specific places, not from global citizens but from people really deeply connected to their land to the whenua around them uh and the moana and the maunga so this yeah i'm i'm i feel very strongly about um the need to be connected to to where we come from and covid was a really interesting time because we, we had to be um we had to really pay attention to our specific local places and that had a mix uh, some people loved lockdown. Some people were placed in very, very precarious and dangerous situations um, because of that. But we were all kind of grounded where we were. Um, and I heard a lot of people say how much they really enjoyed that. You know, I heard people say, I didn't know that tree was there or that that tree, you know, blossomed or bore fruit at this time of year. People were really paying attention to what was around them in, in the natural world. And there's a, a really important beauty to that. Um, another point for me in climate change, my journey was being at a conference where I heard a lot of scientists say, look, we know the facts. What we need now is storytellers to get out there and tell the story. We actually need, need you artists. Um, and I, I, loved, I loved hearing that because I actually think we all have to be working on this right now. Scientists, artists, politicians, community workers it's it's all of our it's all of our issue it it's uh it's something we've got to solve together okay so um it's a little bit for us at barbarian productions we we want to make change with our work um and something that's been important to us recently is i think honoring when you make a show or a piece of art you are really opening up people's minds and hearts um, to a way of being and to a place of, of thinking that they might not have been in before. And that's a beautiful thing. But sometimes, for example, in a theatre show, which has been my predominant medium, you know, I feel you do all this opening up and then it's like, thank you, and people jump in their cars and head off, or they might have an interesting conversation over a glass of wine. But how do we really, like, springboard from, from what that art has opened up and drive that into some kind of action. So uh, a project I really enjoyed recently was um, a theatre piece around sustainability that had partnered with a beach cleanup team. And so after the show, when everyone was feeling quite emotional and sort of woke uh, to the climate catastrophe, I'll say that word, um, then there was someone from the beach cleanup team in the foyer saying, so do you want to sign up? We're going out on this Saturday or this Sunday, or do you want to sign up for next week? And taking names right there and then. And these are the kind of um, collaborative endeavours that make me feel really excited. And I think it happens when we work together 
sometimes artists try to do it on on our own but I think when we partner uh, and work together that's when we can you know really have that synergistic change um, I'd like to Edward if you could put our first my first slide on um, this is one of my favorite collaborations I saw recently which came from Action Station um, and it was a collaboration with an artist Māori Mermaid um, and they're these beautiful uh, beautiful posters a poster campaign that's been out around on the streets and um, I love that there it, it, it's up there where where usually you'd have a piece of adver advertising trying to sell you something but instead this is inviting you to imagine a different a different reality um, and I was so struck by this uh, by putting in this very commercialized space this billboard that just invites you to imagine how things could be done differently and that's one thing that art does very well is invites people to imagine to imagine different spaces and ways of being um, and just on that collaborative note as well Te Papa had an event recently in connection with their Te Taio, um, nature exhibition where they had a night um, and Edward if you can do my second slide please um, they had a night and they had activists and scientists and environmentalists speaking but they also invited artists and musicians and this is actually a project we worked, worked on in the image here we have two performers being albatrosses and they taught the crowd around them a an albatross mating dance which we completely styled you know off the actual mating ritual um and i just loved being all together in that mix and and feeling arts valued alongside those those conversations um around activism and you know delina you talked before about action and how important action is um and absolutely i'm completely with you on that how do we kind of catalyze from what we do in an artwork to then you know making some sort of of action together um you know there's this word art um and there's this word act and um there's like actor and activist might be spelt wrong um but there's this thing of being active you know and then there's this thing of being passive and i feel worried sometimes um for how passive we are with our screens uh we watch we watch a lot of things and we just say very simple answers to things you know yes or no or google reply invites us to say sounds great like very binary you know very computer very zero or one very binary ways of of thinking um and we are just capable of so much richness so just to just to sort of close up really and connect us back to to covid um yeah i think the the awareness that we are deeply connected with the natural world around us and that humans are animals are, are part of this natural world um and rob luha said a beautiful thing on last week's panel about you know when cook arrived and was like wow look at all this art that is here you know i think when humans are well we do blossom and and we make we make art um or as another friend said you can tell how well people are by by the quality of their singing so i i'm coming to you here my final words are um i have some concern about how we are going uh as a as a people at the moment there are a lot of beautiful people doing amazing amazing things um but i've felt more concerned about the inequality that is biting biting again um and has been biting for a long time and we need to change our system around so just edward if you wouldn't mind putting on our my final slide um yeah just this this deeply problematic system that that places people in this hierarchy in this chain of being and puts the earth at the bottom and I think all of the other struggles are interconnected with that and we've got to turn this extractive colonial patriarchal mindset around uh to to honor uh Papa Tuanuku, our earth um and our natural world which is under under threat at the moment um and i'll leave you just with a final quote from putty lancaster who is an amazing artist who speaks about the platform of theater is a process to encounter the diverse realities occurring now and it happens through the encountering of real voices from specific places so real voices from actual specific places um 
namahi kia koutou. Love being part of this panel with you all. Kia ora. Kia ora, jo, and thank you so much for, um, for some of this discussion, which has come from a deep, deep place uh, for you, because this is a journey uh, for, for all of us into this unknown, the complexity and so on. And I, I love the fact you've spoken about what's really special and important is that cultural and spiritual practice deeply connected. Um, so I wonder um, if I can put a question to the panel coming from that. We're living in a, a world that's increasingly individualistic and, and consumer-based, um, which uh, that Western system often undermines um, uh, traditional systems. Um, how is it that we can work with, with art to, to perhaps reconnect people with, with some of those, um, those elements so that we're better placed um, to tackle these, these complex systems that need us to act in a collective way? Perhaps throw it over to Lisa, would you like to, to start? Um, well, I'd just like to make a, a comment. Something that I've said in the past is, um, you know, it's very problematic to travel, of course, um, because of the resources that it takes. But that actually through the, through the process of travel, um, through the process of meeting people and seeing them in the, in the places and spaces that they live is the opportunity to generate empathy. So, um, I mean, for me, I've um, never traveled very much at all. And then suddenly I traveled a lot. And I've traveled a lot over the last um, few years, um, uh, which has been a great joy and also a worry. Um, but I was very much looking forward to being much more rooted in New Zealand now, and I really am. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've, um, I have enjoyed that opportunity to meet with people in their own spaces because I think you learn so much through that process. So I'm not sure how we will be able to do that in the future. Um, it's just something that I'm thinking about now. Um, and for me, it's not, you know, I, I, I have this project where I want to work with um, some various Aboriginal communities and, um, you know, we have this in Maori and we have this uh, concept face to face and of course things, things happen better face to face. Um, but maybe I just have to get used to this idea of more Zooms, although they're quite tiring. I do find them, um, they, have, they take a different kind of energy and they still require energy, any energy in, energy out. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I, I'm in the process of struggling and trying to work through what it is that I'm going to do in the future in order to do, um, tell the stories that I want to in a way that's full of integrity. I mean, that's always been at the basis of um, the work that I try and make. Um, and so, yeah, just really interested to even hear about uh, Norma and Matthew and that just turning out with PPE, <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, because we're, we're at a point where um, po pulling out a camera, it's almost people think that you're going to be on TV or something, you know, like we're still that, that concern around um, the camera for some generations. Um, the fact that it can take something away is how, how can we, how can we use um, effectively the tools that we have at our disposal? Yeah, that's no answer. It's just something that I'm really, really thinking about right now, how to, how to be an international artist um, from my bed head. <laughs> Does anybody else have a, a comment on? Perhaps so I'll, I'll just pick up on on that, Lisa. Yeah, I mean it's it's something I really grappled with in my um, my no fly year. It was a it was very much a response to you know my own responsibilities um, for the climate crisis and um, and and it, it is interesting. You know, I did travel. I still travel. Um, I just did it in a. I did it slowly. Um, I, you know, I didn't go overseas, so that's that's a problem. <laughs> um, 
but I, but I, you know, I, I moved slowly around Aotearoa. I took trains and, and so in, in some ways I, I, I traveled as much and I met as many people as I had otherwise. Perhaps they weren't as diverse um, as I might have done in other years, but, but there was still, you know, I discovered new things still on those journeys. And so I, I'm not sure, you know, I, in the end, I, I didn't, but I felt the loss of most, I guess, was my own personal connections to other places. Um, and I guess, you know, when, when I um, talked through my pepiha at the start, I was talking about some connections to Yorkshire. And that, that was a trip I made um, just recently, which is why it's very much in my mind at the moment. Um, and I think but those are some of the connections that, that, that I lost that year, was those, those international connections. But I discovered many new things within Aotearoa that year. But it, I, yeah, I completely, I, I, I very much, yeah, I, I grappled with that as a scientist as well, because we're, inter, we're international, we work globally, um, and, and we benefit from those interactions. So it's a, it, it, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a change, a very much a change in the way we live our lives. Um, and, and I, you know, and requires some adjustment to how we think about ourselves, I think. Yes, and, and in some ways, I, I don't feel the need to have to travel internationally. I, I think the joy of, of traveling in your own backyard is just as valid as anywhere else. Um, and I, I think, I mean, when you're faced with a problem, it's trying to work out, well, what's the flip side of that? How can we, how can we make the most of this opportunity? What, what's the best that we can take out of that opportunity? And the fact that we do have to stay home, we do have to look at what's happening in our local areas and put some energy and do the best that we can here. Um, yeah, it's, um, but the collective, I thought you were talking about the collective action. Um, you know, we all try to do our own bits, try to live well in our, in our own areas and our own lives. But it wasn't until I went to, um, a couple of years ago, I found myself in Hong Kong and just saw so every, everybody had thousands of plastic bags and there were, plastic bags just going you know just flipping down the streets and I thought oh my goodness what I'm doing at home really is just such a small action when you're faced um, in the world with so many people and maybe there is too many people um, maybe this is a correction um, at the end of the day uh, nature is bigger than all of us and it will it could easily just um, change everything we can't stop it if we're if we're really not careful and cognizant of, of what's happening at this present time. I mean, I'm very um, concerned. I mean, years ago, I was looking at whatever happens to Australia happens in New Zealand. Australia has been facing a lot of um, fires, water issues, etc. And and you know, the, they are the big landmass that is kind of protecting us in a way. And I've I've often thought about. Um, you know, Aboriginal Australia is like the oldest, um, oldest peoples on earth, and we're like the youngest. So, to a kanatana, we really need to learn what we can from these relationships and nurture them in a way that's um, it's very important for this part of the world. Kilda, Kilda Lisa, I just want to pick up on that, and also something which Joe said about we might make ourselves extinct, and come to you, Sean, and just ask for your kind of take on on that. Comment. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, you know, I, I, I think I think uh, which we were just, you know, um, it, it's really it's really we. Were, I don't think that's 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 going to happen. It's we're just going to make ourselves extremely miserable. <laughs> um, you know that that's the reality that that people will survive um, in just a, a, an impoverished, um, rather unpleasant environment, and so I and mean, I do understand Joe's the way you know how Joe was thinking about that and about the correction that will come, um, but I just it's it's a very I think it would be a very depressing, slow end, <laughs> and and we'd lose so many of the things that we value along the way. Um, yeah, and, and, and maybe in, in that way, we do become extinct. 
in the sense that the things that we value as human beings now simply won't be av available um, to our descendants. And that's a, that is a very um, challenging thought. And, um, uh, you know, I do think we need hope. We do need ways forward. Um, you know, my, my reflection on that, my no-fly year, was it, was it gave me a bit of agency. I mean, I knew, I, you know, I can do the maths. As, as Lisa, you know, you, you go to Hong Kong and you see the scale of the problem um, and or you can do the maths like I do and I can see the, you know, when I didn't get on the plane, someone else did, right? <laughs> and they just took my seat and, and the airline sold it for slightly cheaper. Um, and uh, uh, but, but you do get some agency. When you start to make change individually, you get some agency. And if you can share that agency with other people, if you can empower other people, um, and, and uh, I think, again, Joe talked about um, uh, inequality, and, and actually that, that, I think, is the, is the, that's the burning platform, you know, and, it, and, it, it, it's, and to pick up again on what Lisa said, it's not so much that there's too many people, as that there's a small number of us living completely unsustainable lifestyles, um, you know, and, and, and so it, it is about dealing with inequality. And, um, and bringing our societies much more into balance. I think that was part of the work that um, Norma and Matt were doing was to help that message get out to um, people and aud aud audiences, communities who weren't necessarily um, being able to access that easily. Um, I wanted to also ask you, Norma and Matt, just around, we're talking about international travel and obviously you're um, whānau from Samoa, and I know that you would regularly commute. And how has that been for you and for other Pacific people that you know who are based in Aotearoa and actually can't even go home at the moment? Well, Zoom's making a lot of money out of the Pacific at the moment. <laughs> so, you know, everything's online. And, and it's been a great tool and resource to be able to connect us Globally, I know for my own family, for our family, we have, you know, monthly Zoom uh, devotional for our father uh, who has grandchildren in the United States, in Australia, and also here in Aotearoa. So that's been a fantastic resource. And I just kind of wanted to pick up on some of the discussion about, um, you know, the state now of our, of our uh, nation and the future states that our our descendants will inherit. And one of the things that we kind of notice always has been about the mental health of our elders and our families and whatnot as we were filming um, this. And, and if there wasn't already uh, a strong need for a big focus on mental health in, in a lot of our communities, especially our minority communities, you know, we have our nieces on a regular basis. And one of the things that has been really difficult to have to kind of now train them is about not having human contact with other people, animals, when we're out walking, you know, and, and children just have a desire to connect with another human being. And if this is now going to be the norm where we're going to have to, uh, um, I suppose, teach, our, teach or reteach our children to not connect with another human, then if we didn't already have mental health issues now, we're going to be having a lot in the near future. So, you know, what are those discussions and how are organisations who, who hold purse strings or hold authority around some of uh, what can be done, how are they all talking across the sectors about how we can all support because our children are going to inherit not just um, possibly quite a lot of debt, um, but also um, a lot of retraining about something that's such a, a basic human need about to be able to connect human to human with other people. So that's just kind of one thing I wanted to raise. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that. No, um, but I mean, just on the topic of Zooms, um, you know, trying to be optimistic about this, even amongst all the crazy stuff that we had to deal with, um, Zoom became a really brilliant um, part of the production process when we were making this because instead of having um, nine individual video teams for each culture infiltrating nine houses, we had one two-man crew going into nine different households 
bring that data back and then we used Zoom for each family to sit in on the editing um, and, you know, do and watch over the translations. So straight away, in terms of the production pipeline, we have cut the expenditure down by 90%. Um, and so there were a lot of things that kind of happened in the creative process um, out, that happened out of necessity um, that really, you know, informed better ways of doing things as an artist. Um, and so, for, like, another example, like, in the Pacific community, there's an organization, Le Bar, one of their um, government mandates was to push the messaging of um, mental health out there, and we had to shoot these cinematic little 90-second pieces. Problem being, how do you make the same piece for, you know, um, nine different voiceovers, and how do you get that all sorted, you know, and doing it in the quickest turnaround possible? So, essentially, we reverse engineered it, and we figured, okay, well, what we could do is get the government um, script translated in English, uh, that's in English, um, create a storyboard shot list out of that, record all the voiceovers um, of the, the English into the nine different languages, and then went through line by line and averaged out the timing of each sentence. So what might take the Samoans nine seconds to say in a phrase would take the Nuans five seconds, which would take the Cook Islanders 12 seconds and would analyze all the data, average out that timing, and that timing would inform the storyboard duration of that shot. So we would use all the data to kind of create, like um, time up the storyboard. So now we had this one video that would average out across nine different translations and the translations were still on average speaking to the shot on, on the screen. And so um, as much as there's been some challenges in, in a lot of that, um, it's, it's out of necessity created new ways of doing things as, as an artist. And I guess that goes back to this whole um, pioneering aspect of our ancestors. You know, we've always been told that we were, you know, while the rest of the world were playing it safe and they didn't dare, you know, voyage beyond the safety line of their shorelines. You know, as Pacific people, we were always the ones that would dare to go to, in, into the unknown and, you know, to navigate further and to, and to just voyage into the unknown. And it feels like the, this climate that we're in is the unknown. And so for myself, it became a reminder to just double down on that spirit of leaning into the unknown. Um, and as tricky and as scary as it all can be, look for the silver linings and how can we use this to our benefit? How can we reverse engineer things to be more efficient, um, more clinical in the way we do things, more mindful, absolutely. Um, and just, you know, get, get better um, outcomes across the board for everybody. Amazing, oh. the voyage into the unknown. I just wanted to come to a quick, to, with a question for you, Joe, because I know you're holding space in Wellington for the arts community and, and up at the Vogelmorn Bowling Club. Um, how, what, what's, how are you trying to voyage into the unknown and take your community with you? Um, well, I think we're trying to really bring arts more strongly into community spaces and just mash up, mash up different groups of people who would not usually work together. Um, so, yeah, I think I love hearing you guys, Matt and Norma, talk about that that amazingly responsive communication that you do and how quickly, well, to use that trendy word, pivoted or, you know, found out how to solve those problems, you know, like you're such great creative thinkers who can make those sort of immediate and responsive and flexible shifts. Um, and I think, yeah, so trying to like mainstream, mainstream art more. I mean, art is mainstream, Aim, art is, is normal and natural. Like it's not something that only artists do. This awesome campaign, you know, here Mahi Toi Tene, um, this, this is artwork, like uh, art is everywhere around us and we should, singing is normal, dancing is normal. That's just something that we all should be doing as humans all the time. So trying to like mash <laughs> art practice and, and as a Pākehā culture, that's not something we do so well. Uh, Māori and Pacific culture is incredibly advanced at that um, integration. Um, so we're trying to normalise and mainstream art more. Um, and I think just to that question you posed earlier, um, Sarah, about like what can art do? You know, I think art can can communicate complexities, like like you were saying, Sean, uh, and it can also posit like 
imaginary futures or different realities, even just to say it doesn't have to be like this, um, opens up a possibility of thinking about things a different way. It can also disrupt. And I think that um, I completely agree about needing hope and I try to hold on to hope and optimism, but some people need a lot more disrupting than others. <laughs> there are some people who really need to be disrupted from their norm way of thinking. I'm talking about our, you know, deeply entrenched um, capitalist and, and patriarchal and racist and sexist cultures. Not to go on about that, trying to be positive, but you know, that is there and that system needs to be disrupted. Um, and I think I just really want to honour that from what I know about change making, um, change never comes easily, like it takes really pushing and working, and that can be fun if we bring creativity into the process, but it's not just going to be an easy slide, you know, we, we have to keep working at it, that's, that's my feeling that I have just now, and I also just want to honour your work, Lisa, which is so powerful, and that's one of the last things I want to say that art does, is it can bring things into the body. So for me, Lisa, when I experience your work and your collaborations, it it hits me viscerally. And I think that's what art can do. It can take statistics and data and actually make that personal and make it um, a physical body feeling, which can then motivate people to actually take action. Kia ora. Oh, thank you. Because on that note, perfect note to finish, I'd like to thank all of you, Lisa, Sean, Noma, Matthew, and Joe. Uh, it's been a really rich discussion on tonight's panel, leaping from the COVID crisis to the climate crisis, but beyond that, how do we connect as communities and create and shape the future we want for everyone? So thank you all. Recordings of this live streamed event will be available to view on Pans and Track Zero Facebook pages and the Auckland Live YouTube channel. A total call what uh, Sarah just said, a huge thank you to our panellists and thank you to the team from Track Zero, Pans and Auckland Live. Thank you also to our supporters, the Royal Society and the Big Idea and to everyone who has been watching this panel this evening. Our online live stream Corridor series Arts and Climate Action will continue next Wednesday, the 23rd of September with our final session of the series with the topic borrowing or investing in future generations. Please join us again. We'll be speaking with rangatahi and young voices, including panelists Aingangele Fili, Fipuliai Tapuai, who is a spoken word poet, orator, and indigenous activist and chairperson of For the Culture, Professor of Political Science, Director of Hei Pua Waitanga Sustainable Development and Civic Imagination Research Group at the University of Canterbury, Professor Bronwyn Hayward, artists, student and student strike for climate national committee member Tilly King, writer, journalist, journalist, activist, and the writer and host of the podcast mm. Here Kākano Aho, Kahu Kutia, and actus, act, artist and activator Hana Maihi. And I'll close our session today with a whakatauki. Toi tu te marae o tāne, toi tu te marae o tangaroa, toi tu te iwi. No data, have a lovely evening. Kia kaha ki te reo Māori, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. <laughs>